Welcome to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Sanj Kakar, and we are recording this podcast on April the 20th, 2020. While the COVID-19 pandemic continues, efforts are beginning to reopen the country and move to a new normal that is guided by important public health principles. With us to discuss the latest information is Mayo Clinic infectious disease and vaccine expert, Dr. Greg Poland. Dr. Poland, thanks again for joining us. My pleasure. All the news uh, um, this weekend has been about reopening the country and restarting the economy. Since we last spoke on Friday, what have you been seeing regarding trends, uh, regarding numbers for COVID-19? When you look at it, just since Friday, today's Monday, we've got about 100,000 more documented infections in in the U.S. and about 5,000 more deaths. While there's starting to be some slowdown, we're not there yet. I, I understand that people are sort of tired of the social distancing, but we're just starting to, to see the fruit of those efforts from 14 days ago. Let's not jump the gun prematurely. Well, that, that's sobering statistics to hear. As you said, obviously, we're trying to think about getting back to life as normal as we can. But as an infectious disease expert, what sort of principles do you think we should be adhering to as we slowly start trying to reopen things? Yeah, Sanj, that's actually a, a very good and, and excellent question because it really puts the finger on, all right, if we're going to do this, under what conditions do we do it? And there are really sort of four of those. One is that we need to see the caseload really bend down low, which is an indication of decreased community transmission. Secondly, we need the ability to do testing, and we're not quite there yet. Once we have that testing, the ability to do uh, contact tracing so that we can quarantine and isolate remaining cases. And the last one, and this is a big issue, uh, particularly for some of our major cities, you don't want to do that unless you have hospital and medical care capacity. In other words, you don't want to trigger something happening and again have a surge uh, demand on on the medical system. So when you say uh, another surge, are you talking about the second wave that we, we're hearing about? It could, it could either be that this fall or by opening prematurely, increasing community transmission and increasing number of cases. That's what happened, for example, in Japan. They sent their kids back to school, I, I think, prematurely. Um, th- that experiment has been done. And what did we see 14 days later? major uptick in cases again. You mentioned about testing and there's there's some confusion about testing. You know, people think, well, if I don't have the symptoms, why do I need to be tested? Can you just explain uh, from the infectious disease aspect, why is testing so important? It's, it's, uh, it's important for two reasons. The molecular diagnostic tests we have, what you hear called RT-PCR, those are tests designed to tell us, are you currently infected or have the virus? Um, So that's important because we're going to want to isolate those or quarantine those individuals, not let them work, for example, and transmit it to others. The other test is serology tests. These are tests done after the fact to say, were you infected in the recent past and might that mean immunity? Obviously, the advantage of knowing that is you're, you're not concerned about your own risk anymore. And you're able to go back to work. Uh, let's say you're a healthcare worker, for example. You're able to go back to work and not have to use uh, the same level of PPE potentially. So when we've talked about testing in the past on the show, we, we've talked about, as you said, the RT-PCR, the serology testing. We've also talked about putting the nasal uh, swab down. Uh, but you know, when we're hearing about we don't have enough tests, mm. what are we talking about? Are we talking about those? Are we are talking about the finger prick test? What are we talking about? We're really talking about all of them. Uh, I I neglected to say one other important part about doing the serology testing is to know what percent of a community has been infected, because that's really a key thing. If we were to find out, for example, that 70%, that's not going to be the case, but 70% of a community had been infected, well, you're getting up toward herd immunity and it's likely safe to do so. But if it's more like 5% or 10%, you still have 90% of your population at risk. So if that's the case indeed, and then we have an an uptick in cases, if we go back too quickly, what do you see happening there? Do you see us then reinstigating all these stay at home orders, social distancing? Exactly, and I I think that would put us in a very tough position. Uh, Would people really be willing 
to flip the switch that rapidly and basically start all over because of the lag period between when you get infected and when you start developing symptoms and then when you actually end up needing medical care. So going premature in opening means we might start all of this over again rather than sustain this for another two, three weeks, see that that caseload really is flattened down and then in a phased way begin to reopen. Last week, we also talked about some of the promising news uh, regarding treatment and and in Mm. particular remdesivir. Since we last spoke, has there been anything new that's come onto the horizon regarding treatments? Yes, uh, Sanjan, thank you for the question because I think this is a real bright spot. Uh, About 30 minutes ago, a paper was released. Um, This is an NIH group, excellent study, where they took two groups of monkeys, exposed them both to SARS-CoV-2 at an appropriate dose, and then 12 hours later started infusing remdesivir. So one group got remdesivir, one group got placebo. In the group that got remdesivir, viral titers were dramatically suppressed. They didn't develop pulmonary infiltrates. They didn't die. And in the uh, placebo-treated monkeys, none of that was the case. So I think we're learning two things. At least in this small animal study, remdesivir was very helpful. Um, no, No doubt about that. But the second point, and and it's a significant point for us as clinicians treating humans, is that it's very likely, as many of us thought, that you're going to have to initiate that antiviral treatment as early as possible in the course of disease. Now, this is not unknown to us. This is exactly the case for influenza. We try to get uh, antiviral drugs into influenza patients within 48 hours, at most 72 hours after they develop symptoms. So I think the way it's going to turn out is that remdesivir will be useful, but we're going to really have to push it toward the left. That is uh, very early in the course of infection, particularly for people who have risk factors for complicated disease. That's very promising uh, indeed. And last week, we also uh, explained that perhaps you're the most infectious with this disease before you actually develop any symptoms. So it just shows how how important getting uh, early testing as applicable with possible treatment early may may be where we need to go with this. Absolutely. And, And also why this lag period between when you are infectious and then you're talking another 14 days before you start seeing the consequences of that transmission to other people. And that's why this is a, this is a slow process in terms of uh, reopening. Last week, we also talked about the other infections that can happen with COVID-19 and the other pathologies. Uh, we, you just mentioned about pulmonary disease. Uh, what else are we learning regarding how this is affecting other areas of the body? It is very apparent that having one infection does not in some magical way protect you against another infection. So you think about during the winter season in the United States, for example, depending on where you live, you're exposed to SARS-CoV-2, influenza A, influenza B, RSV, measles, mumps, pertussis, human metanumavirus, rhinovirus. Well, that's about eight or nine right there. And in this study, what was shown is that about 20% of people who were COVID-19 positive were also infected with another respiratory pathogen. That's important for a couple of reasons. Number one, a co-infection may mean worse disease. The other thing is that some of those other viruses and respiratory bacteria are treatable. So we wouldn't want to just do a COVID test and say positive or negative and then treat uh, therapeutically based on that. They may have influenza and that's treatable. They might have pertussis and that's treatable. So we we would want to know that. And and it's an important clinical fact to bear in mind. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's, It's interesting how you mentioned all of those viruses. So as we obviously get through the summer and we go into the winter, the flu epidemic will start again. And and so to prevent this, we talk about vaccinations. What is your message to the the public regarding the flu vaccine and whether they should be having that or not? Yeah, well, because that will be the most prominent respiratory virus that that circulates, 
we really do want people to get influenza immunized as soon as the vaccine becomes available. Now, we do not have a culture of that in the U.S. In our highest risk patients, which are the elderly, maybe we get 60% of them to take the flu vaccine. An important part of that is that uh, COVID-19 and influenza symptoms overlap essentially identically. So it's going to cause the individual a lot of concern. It again causes this surge capacity that the medical system can't easily meet. So by getting influenza vaccine, you're taking a good deal of that respiratory disease off the table so that we can concentrate on COVID-19 and you're decreasing the chance of co-infection, meaning if you did get infected with COVID-19, you're likely to not have as severe a course as if you also had influenza infection. And so Dr. Poland, a lot of people will, will get the flu vaccine, but they'll push it off. They'll say, well, I'll get it in February or March. What, what's your message to those uh, people? Yeah, again, because as we, very likely as we move into our fall, uh, we're gonna start seeing cases of COVID-19 because of the burden of disease that will occur in the Southern hemisphere. It'll recirculate back up here is almost certainly the case. So I think perhaps uniquely in this regard, We'll want people to get their influenza vaccine early and not delay it. So as we're looking to try and get back to normality, we're entering the summer season, schools are out, families are thinking of vacations, etc. As we've talked about how this disease process is, is the new norm now, what is your thoughts as, as people try and think about these plans? What I think is likely to happen, and this is going to be a very... This is going to be a choreographed dance, is the way I would put it. Because I think as we get into our actual summer, we'll see cases decrease and some phased-in normalcy. My fear and my concern is then as we move into the fall and winter time in the U.S., in the Northern Hemisphere, we're going to start seeing increasing numbers of cases. And, and the reason for that is we won't have herd immunity. My guess is it'll be, depending on the geographic location, 5 10%, maybe something like that will have been infected, but the vast majority of us will not have been. And then very likely we'll have another outbreak like what we've seen. So it'll be this slowly coming out of the, 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 the distancing we're doing now, more and more normalcy Then, if I'm right about the fall, then phasing right back into the social distancing, mask wearing, uh, maybe teleworking, et cetera, till we get through or develop a vaccine that can be used. You know, while we're all getting tired of this, I, I think we're getting a handle on this. We're learning a lot. A fantastic amount of scientific and medical knowledge has been generated. There's, there's more to go, but we're seeing really encouraging signs in terms of uh, the patience and forbearance of changing our lives to bend this curve down is starting to work. So let, let's not fatigue and give up. In addition, we're seeing some real medical breakthroughs, I think, in terms of these early studies with uh, remdesivir in particular. And, and I think this is going to give us a, a lot of motivation to start doing clinical trials very early in the course of disease with remdesivir. Always a, a pleasure and an honor to speak to Dr. Uh, Greg Poland, a Mayo Clinic COVID-19 expert. Thanks for joining us today again, Greg. My pleasure. You're doing a lot of good by educating. I appreciate it. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.